If you enjoy treats, you're hardly alone. A 2023 survey found that nearly three quarters of Americans admit to having a sweet tooth. But of course, today you can get a sweet treat that doesn't have to include sugar as all these little colored packets that you find in the sugar bowls at restaurants a test. Artificial sweeteners have been around longer than you might imagine, and about as long as they've been around, they've offered questions and challenges for people whose job it is to regulate the food supply. The story of saccharin, the world's first artificial sweetener, is a story of science, of industry regulation, and of consumers who are seeking a way to have a sweet treat without the guilt. And it's history that deserves to be remembered. The story of the first artificial sweetener doesn't exactly start where you might expect. A publication of the United States Centers for Disease Control explains that coal tars are byproducts of the carbonization of coal to produce coke or natural gas. Physically, they're usually viscous liquids or semi-solids that are black or dark brown with a naphthalene-like odor. This black goop byproduct of refining coal is surprisingly versatile. It's the stuff that covers railroad ties to preserve them. It's a common ingredient in paint. It's used in various shampoos, lotions, and ointments, and yet also a valuable ingredient in various medicines, so much so that it is included in the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. As coal, gas, and coke were critical fuels driving the industrial age, there was, not surprisingly, interest among chemists in finding uses for this versatile byproduct. In 1878, Konstantin Fallberg, a Russian-American chemist working in the chemistry lab at Johns Hopkins University, was, in his own words, working upon the compound radicals and substitution byproducts of coal tar, when, one evening, I was so interested in my laboratory that I forgot about my supper until quite late, and then rushed off for a meal without washing my hands. Now, if you think it may be a tad concerning that a professional chemist working with coal byproducts didn't wash his hands before eating, the poor hygienic choice turned out to be serendipitous. He explained, I sat down, broke a piece of bread, and put it to my lips. It tasted unspeakably sweet. Assuming that the bread had been sugared for some reason, he rinsed his mouth with water and dried his mustache with his napkin, only to discover, to my surprise, that the napkin tasted sweeter than the bread. Eventually, the confused chemist surmised that I was the cause of the singularly universal sweetness and accordingly tasted the end of my thumb and found it surpassed any confectionery I had ever eaten. Astounded, he explained, I had discovered or made some coal tar substance that out-sugared sugar. Then he did what any person might do. I dropped my dinner and ran back to the laboratory, and there in my excitement, I tasted the contents of every beaker and evaporating dish on the table. My 17-year-old daughter's in high school chemistry, and she even knows to wash her hands and not drink whatever was left laying around on the lab table. But after carelessly consuming copious quantities of coal tar, the confound chemist came upon the correct compound. Luckily for me, he noted, none of them contain any corrosive or poisonous liquid. What came after is a matter of some controversy. The Johns Hopkins Laboratory was under the leadership of pioneering chemist Ira Remsen, in a publication of Philadelphia's Science History Institute, writes that under his direction, the lab had been working on sulfobenzoic acids. Fallberg had been working as part of the Institute's research, and Fallberg and Remsen co-published articles on the compound that they labeled benzoic sulfonide, discussing its formulation and properties, including that it possessed a very marked sweet taste, being much sweeter than cane sugar. The respective role of the two men in the discovery is still a matter of discussion, but neither seemed to mention at the time the potential commercial applications of what was the world's first artificial sweetener. Remsen seems to have been rather surprised when, in 1896, after having left the lab, Fallberg applied for a patent for the process without mentioning Remsen at all. Remsen felt that as the director of the lab, he should have been included. The rift between the two never appears to have been healed. Remsen would eventually become president of Johns Hopkins University, referring to Fallberg as a scoundrel. And that would not be the last controversy surrounding this new artificial sweetener that Fallberg called saccharin, a word that simply means sugary. But the new substance had its advantages. It was some 500 times sweeter than sugar, water-soluble and heat-stable. Fallberg wrote that it does not decay, mold, or ferment, neither is it attacked by bacteria. Fallberg wrote, when the public first saw saccharin, everything changed. An 1887 edition of the Somerset, England, Wells Journal explained that it must be admitted that visions of commercial success soon overcame the love of theoretical research, and Dr. Fallberg 
applied himself resolutely to the task of isolating the new substance with a view to producing it upon a large scale, so as to allow of its replacing cane sugar in many of its present applications. Falberg decided to produce the new product at a factory in Germany, as he was deterred from doing so in the United States by the high price of skilled labor and high tariffs on fine chemicals in the United States. Mass manufacturing was key. An 1886 edition of the Sterling, Kansas Bulletin reported that its high price has hitherto prevented its acquiring commercial importance. But the Rudensatz Leitmeritz now states that several costly steps in its production have been eliminated and it is likely to become very useful to confectioners. The Wells Journal wrote that indeed the demand for it is already considerable. Falberg wrote that it was being used by manufacturers of glucose and beet sugar, which are inferior in sweetness to cane sugar, but superior in digestibility and healthfulness. The addition of the tiniest fraction of saccharin, he proclaimed, makes him quite the equal of the finest cane sugars in the market. He speculated that in the future, the new sugar will be used by druggists, physicians, bakers, confectioners, candy makers, preserve and pickle makers, liquor distillers, winemakers, and dealers in butler supplies. But the Wells Journal notes, it is anticipated that it will be largely used for dietetic purposes. The journal reports that it is unanimously agreed that saccharin does not undergo assimilation that is rapidly voided by the system unchanged and undecomposed. Falberg announced that it has no injurious effect upon the human system. The Science History Institute writes that Falberg had tested saccharin in late 1882. After consuming 10 grams of the chemical, he waited 24 hours and experienced no adverse reactions. In fact, his body barely responded. Almost the entire dose passed unmetabolized into his urine. These properties, the Wells Journal explains, means that it may be safely employed by diabetic patients and by persons suffering from gouty effects or from obesity and from liver complaints as a sweetening material for beverages, where the use of ordinary sugar would be out of the question. The Science History Institute writes that with his newly patented production method, Falberg set up shop in New York City, where he and one employee produced five kilograms of saccharin a day for use as a drink additive. Offered in pill and powder form, saccharin's popularity grew quickly. Doctors began to prescribe it to treat headaches, nausea, and corpulence. Like sugar before, it, saccharin became an all-purpose curative. Canners used it as a preservative. Diabetics used it to sweeten coffee or tea. But the growing use raised concern. Harvey Washington Wiley is a legend in the arena of industrial regulation. Born in Indiana, like both Remsen and Falberg, he had studied chemistry in Germany. Appointed chief chemist at the Department of Agriculture in 1882, he became an advocate for regulation of adulterated foods. Became known as Old Borax after testing commonly used preservatives such as borax and formaldehyde with poison squads made up of volunteers. His crusading was a primary driver behind the passing of the Food and Drug Act of 1906 and the creation of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, of which he was the first director. The website of the FDA writes that he left a legacy to the American pure food movement as its crusading chemist that was both broad and substantial. With a growing national profile and a progressive reformer of a president in Theodore Roosevelt, in 1906 Wiley set his sights on saccharin. The specific argument at the time was not so much that his test had proven saccharin to be dangerous, but that it was an unsuitable substitute for sugar, which, unlike saccharin, had nutritional value. The Science History Institute explains, he had long crusaded to rein in what he saw as an out-of-control food industry. In 1908, Wiley proposed the first saccharin ban, taking his case straight to President Theodore Roosevelt. Wiley's specific concern was the use of saccharin in canned sweet corn. He recalled that he walked into the meeting and said, everyone who ate that sweet corn was deceived. He thought he was eating sugar when in point of fact he was eating a coal tar product totally devoid of food value and extremely injurious to health. But Wiley was in for a surprise. First, the president had already had a discussion on the subject with James S. Sherman, a New York congressman and ally who represented his family's business, Sherman Brothers Food Manufacturing, who had told him that the company had saved the then-significant sum of $4,000 by replacing sugar with saccharin. But perhaps more importantly, the president himself had experience on the matter. A publication of the Food and Drug Administration writes that in his early career as a rough rider in the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt was the 19th century's embodiment of the physically active and robust outdoorsman, a true rugged individualist. Apparently, however, by 1907, the president's desk job had taken its toll on the president's physician, in an effort to curve his growing corpulence, prescribed a diet devoid of sugar, replacing it with saccharin. Wiley's sweet tongue had touched a sour note with the rotund ruler.
Wiley recalled the conversation. The president said, You tell me that saccharin is injurious to health? And I said, Yes, Mr. President, I do tell you that. And he replied, Dr. Rixey gives it to me every day. I answered, Mr. President, he, he probably thinks you may be threatened with diabetes. And to this he retorted, Anyone who says saccharin is injurious to health is an idiot. The Science History Institute writes that regulatory science in the form of Wiley had collided with industrial market priorities. In the anecdotal evidence of a single, influential consumer, President Roosevelt, whose personal physician had prescribed saccharin to help his patient slim down, had trumped them both. Wiley commented, had he only extended his royal Excalibur, I should have risen as Sir Idiot. As food regulation had become more controversial, Roosevelt appointed a new board to oversee Wiley called the Referee Board of Consulting Scientific Experts. The head of the board was the influential president of Johns Hopkins University. The FDA publication notes, Saccharin, as one might have predicted, given the fact that the head of the board, Johns Hopkins professor Dr. Ira Remsen, had discovered it, received a pardon from the referee board in their reassessment of its safety. The Science History Institute notes that it was saccharin that established the relationship between regulators and industry. In the years to come, this pattern would repeat itself. Uncertain science provoked regulatory action, dismaying major segments of industry and the public, while invigorating those who saw regulators as protectors of the public welfare. Industry and regulators each had their own scientists, and often their own incompatible sets of scientific evidence. The notion of scientific consensus began to break down as questions of safety became more complicated. The relationship between industry and regulators grew antagonistic as medical evidence became less conclusive and more open to interpretation. Saccharin then found a boon in the two world wars where sugar rationing created a need and it was presented as patriotic to use saccharin, sold in pills, instead of sugar. But the story of regulation and saccharin was not finished. The Science History Institute writes that had saccharin remained merely a sugar alternative, important only to a relatively small number of diabetics and weight watchers during peacetime, it probably would not have caught the eye of government regulators and scientists. But after the Second World War, the uses for saccharin grew, largely driven by a more urbanized population, more reliant on processed foods. The Los Angeles Times writes, but its popularity wouldn't surge until the 1950s, when dieting came into vogue and women in particular began casting about for low-calorie foods and ingredients. Growing concern with food additives led to the Food Additive Amendment in 1958, which then attached the Delaney Clause, named after Representative James Delaney of New York, which the Government Accountability Office explains, requires the Food and Drug Administration to ban food additives which are found to cause or induce cancer in humans or animals, as indicated by testing. Application of this clause led to the Great Cranberry Scare of 1958, the subject of another episode of The History Guy. The clause would catch up with saccharin in 1977, when the FDA, provided with evidence that it increased the likelihood of bladder cancer in rats, tried to ban the substance under the Delaney Clause. However, again, saccharin had its saviors. The LA Times explains that a million people wrote letters opposing the ban. The Times says that Carolyn de la Pena, a professor of American studies at UC Davis, attributes the outcry to the fact that Americans were less trusting of government in the late 1970s and to the fact that the Calorie Control Council, which represents the diet, food, and drink industry, ran an ad campaign encouraging consumers to protest the ban. While the safety of saccharin was debated in the press, the FDA backed off a ban, but instead Congress passed the Saccharin Study and Labeling Act which held off the ban, but required that all products containing saccharin have a warning label. Use of this product may be hazardous to your health. This product contains saccharin, which has been determined to cause cancer in laboratory animals. If the label was intended to warn consumers away, it failed. The Science History Institute notes that in response, sweet and low sales skyrocketed. Those sales included longtime buyers stocking up in case of a ban, but the free publicity also brought in new customers. By 1979... 44 million Americans use saccharin daily. Consumers voted with their dollars. So it appears that this coal tar byproduct has always been on the front lines of this battle between regulators, consumers, and industry. But is this an example of rapacious industry stymieing legitimate attempts to protect the food supply, or is it one of consumers successfully pushing back against government overreach? Well, oldies like me might remember the debate in the 1970s over whether drinking a can of tab is going to give you cancer, it was relatively less reported in 2001 when the requirement that saccharin be listed as a dangerous ingredient was quietly dropped.
it turns out that the studies linking saccharin to bladder cancer were flawed. Not only did the studies represent unrealistic amounts of saccharin consumption, the National Institutes of Health notes that humans would need to drink the equivalent of 800 12-ounce diet sodas with saccharin daily to reach the carcinogenic doses that induce rat bladder cancer, but the effect was unique to the function of proteins in the urinary tract of rats, in a way not replicated in humans. Today, the FDA considers saccharin to be safe for consumption. And while saccharin was never actually banned in the United States, the constant risk of a ban did lead companies to search for other alternatives and develop things like aspartame and sucralose and neotame, which have eaten into the artificial sweetener market. And the Science History Institute notes that all this publicity about safety uh, received so much press that suspicion of artificial sweeteners has worked its way into the public consciousness. But yet saccharin still survives today. Millions of people dump it into their coffee. It's the stuff in the little pink pack. Packets, although those will often include a, another sweetener, something like dextrose, in order to cover up the aftertaste. It's also commonly in some products you might not know about, especially dental products like toothpaste and tooth whitener, where its stability gives it an advantage over other artificial sweeteners, but of course it doesn't contribute to tooth decay. And the issue isn't totally resolved. It's still a matter of discussion among regulators and consumer advocates, so that after more than a century of suspicion and study, the debate over the safety of saccharin lives on. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.